Um, hi everyone, I'm Philip Mason, I'm from Durham University. I'm a great enthusiast about genre, but I have some bugbears about it. Are you genre people? Do you teach using genres and all the rest of it? Magnificent and fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> Insightful, brilliant, okay, good. Now, I wasn't going to talk too much about what genre theory is, because I presume people who come here might know about that, and they've given me 20 minutes, okay? So I may, may have to speak quickly at certain points in this presentation. Um, I like, yes, yeah, so, so I'm a great fan. I've published stuff on business case reports, the genre of business case reports, and options analysis in um, business case reports. And, you know, I found, I've always found Swales' ideas and genre very, you know, really fascinating and insightful, you know. So, in a sense, I love it, but I have some irritations. And actually, this is more about, I put problems, issues, and solutions. They may be just my problems, issues, and solutions, okay? Because I have things which are bugbears about genre theories and ideas, okay? So I'm looking at, in this session, I'm going to look at communicative purpose and social purpose, um, defining characteristics of uh, genre theory, the nature of rhetorical moves and their characterization, analysis of genres, the impact of swales in ESP genre theory in the EAP classroom, effectiveness of genre-based teaching. Come in, have a seat. Okay. Um, so there's a few categories I'm going to look at. I don't know how brilliantly insightful this is, but I just think about these things and it, these things cause me pain, okay? <laughs> so communicative purpose, I'm sure we know in this room, is essential to ESP, Swales, the genre analysis. And even in the Askerhave and Swales paper a bit later, CP is still a privileged criterion in the assignation of genre identities, okay? Askerhave and Swales, 2001. Um, Askerhave came up with the idea of multiple communicative purposes rather than the approach, the, the more singular approach of John Swales before that. They got together and produced a paper on, which is very useful in about how to determine communicative purpose. Nestle and Gardner, operating in the EAP context, you're aware of their genres in higher education, use social purpose as the basis for their text classification, as do Martin and others, Martin and Rothery, Rothery 1981, in the Australian genre school. Um, and sometimes writers just use the term purpose. Sometimes CP, communicative purpose and social purpose, are used as if they are the same. So I read, I'm sorry, I read intensively. I think, hold on, you know, you're using both these terms as if they are the same. What is, but what is communicative purpose? We have realizations of communicative purpose people produce. And what is social purpose? Are these different, the same? Do they overlap? Maybe you have a simple answer to that question, but for me this has been a source of confusion and pain, and for me it would be useful to have these actually defined and described. John Swales, again, I've, re I've read genre analysis probably 50 times, I can't find him defining what he means by communicative purpose. I can find realisations, but what is he trying to say, what is communicative purpose, and what is social purpose? Um, there's no definition in, in the Swales genre analysis 1990, as far as I can find, and no justification why CP should be used instead of social purpose. So social purpose was around in the ideas, has been around the ideas of Martin and Rothery and the others I've mentioned. Okay, so I'm going to use communicative purpose. Please tell me why. Okay, maybe it's good, maybe it isn't good, maybe you've got your reasons. But I would like, maybe it's about a system of thinking. Nessie and Gardner use um, social purpose rather than communicative purpose in their book on higher education. But again, I couldn't find a, a, the rationale for using that in there, you know, there, there will undoubtedly be good reason for using it, but it's not discussed, and for me this is a bit painful. Maybe my system of thought and all the rest of it. Um, right, okay. For me, CP, communicative purpose allows flexibility in terms of the element having a purpose. So you can say the speaker or the society maybe has a communicative purpose, um, but social apply purpose tends to be applied to the text or genre. So, I go to a dictionary definition, which I would like to be out there, I suppose. Chandra and Mundy's de dictionary definition, the communicative purpose is the primary goal and intention of anyone involved in an action of communication or a given on a given occasion. That's fair enough to me, but again, I have some slight pain because communication is about the effects of your communication on the recipient or a hearer. And so to talk about the act of communication without talking about communication's effect on the person who's receiving it, so it's a research, you know, what are you trying to do with the things that you're saying, basically? 
and so I want to put communicative purpose in terms of the effect on a on a listener or a reader and if you go to so again we have things like identifying a gap or things like that but what about the effect on the reader you could say these things are implied can't you and they're in the broader ideational background to what's being discussed but for me uh, any communi you know, communicative purpose communication is about effects on speakers things we might want to achieve even if that's just conversation and keeping a, 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 an interaction relationship going so business case report on an academic program the, the CP might be to persuade the lecturer reader that the writer knows and understands and can apply business theory in a realistic business context so when I'm talking about CP I always put you know uh, the the listener or the reader there so you know I, for me that's a better encapsulation of what's <coughs> going on social purpose uncontroversially the role that a text performs in the social community and again the social purpose might be framed as to act as a vehicle for preparing students for professional practice that's modified from Nessie and Gardner or to act as a vehicle for the demonstration and development of professional practice through the analysis of a single exemplar actually uh, modified from Nessie and Gardner again and, and this time the term educational purpose is used in one of their tables so we've got educational purpose social purpose um, but for me I just wanted want some clarity in what these things are formulation of rhetorical move moves are the building blocks of communicative structure uh, Bautier says moves are rhetorical instruments that realize a subset of communicative purposes associated with a genre Swales describes a move as a term of art which is a lovely way of describing it and it allows maximum flexibility doesn't it quite a bit and a lot of interpretation and as a discoursal and rhetorical unit performing a coherent communicative function and he goes on to say that the identification um, that the identification and setting of move boundaries established by a mixed bag of criteria allowing flexibility which produce defensible action criteria in a process which is essentially bottom-up in nature that bottom-up bit might be a bit controversial I did summarize these ideas in my thesis quite a long time ago 2010 I have you know so the nature of moves but anyway for me is a research article untro introduction not a move so if you're aware of Swales's work we get moves within um, the introduction and he talks about identifying a gap and all these kind of things and um, claiming centrality in the original model etc but isn't that an introduction a move doesn't an introduction produce a com execute represent a com coherent communicative function couldn't we say an introduction is a move well I feel so I feel so I don't know if that's good I think so as well by the way uh, is an RA conclusion not a rhetorical move why not what is the status of an introduction again I've read my swale my books and I don't find any you know an introduction surely is that not a move well good we'll have chance for discussion at the end I don't feel like yeah yeah why is establishing a territory a move but not introducing the research article well I don't see the logic there maybe you can please explain these are thoughts okay I haven't um, yes introductions perform a coherent communicate communicate function as do conclusions for me these can be seen as rhetorical moves Nessie and Gardner refer to introduction as a stage Young refers to phases in texts so the introduction might be seen as a phase but aren't they actually moves right well your comments would be welcome and then again if we're looking further into this aren't there mul multiple possible perspectives and formulations of moves could we not use elements of for example toolman logic which perspectives are we going to adopt so toolman logic you have claims ground warrant I've got grounds twice okay backing rebuttal uh, can't these be used in some context to define moves as well why are we choosing the moves that we are choosing um, which move structures do we accept as a profession and which do we not accept and on what basis so I've got a few questions here about how our field works here so persuasive individuals so John Swales his model we love that okay but is that actually within a profession a logical rational way should we I suppose you have committees that look at language and you know decide right forms of language in France or whatever it is. Right, okay. uh, but you know how do we accept I suppose we have our systems of publication 
for how to move models get accepted. How do we do this? Um, as Swales identifies move uh, within the move steps that are available, Bhatia used the term sub-moves. I like, for me, there may be sub-sub-moves, realizing sub-moves. These depths go on forever and ever, actually, or potentially forever and ever. Um, so I've got something from options analysis of business case reports. Stages themselves can be a form of move or sub-move. Um, so if an introduction and other similar structures can reasonably be considered as moves, then I would suggest that these are not referred to as stages or phases, but maybe as macro moves or something like that. I like my new names. Right, 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going quickly. And then we could have consistency of terminology. Macro moves, moves, and sub-moves, and sub-sub. All right, that's my mathematical desire for some kind of logical, math coherent system anyway. A coherent set of labels for itemizing how the rhetorical purposes of text are realized. Right. Um, another bugbear, but I've sort of mentioned it already. Formulations, labeling of moves is often divorced from purpose, formulated in terms of intended effect. Uh, divorced from purpose, formulated in terms of intended effect on the reader and recipient. I think we can lose sight sometimes through our move models. If I'm teaching, I suppose, I want to talk to my students about what effect they're trying to have on the actual reader or the, 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 the listener and identify a gap. Okay, why? I realise this is an abbreviated heading, but we can lose sight of, you know, yes, you're trying to identify a gap. What's the reason for it? And I say it could be for abbreviation, that we have these kind of move labels, but for me, providing an explanation of the goal of a move and of a text, of course, is crucial to me and should inform labelling and moves. Why do we accept like, establishing a niche? I suppose I could, Swales acknowledges the metaphorical nature of his moves. In practice, the RA move establishing a niche, niche might perhaps become providing the reader with key conceptual information supporting understanding of the research area. That tells my student what they're trying to do. Whereas establishing a niche, well, maybe that tells you. What, my, my students actually tend to be confused by this metaphorical language. but. It's a powerful metaphor, isn't it? Met metaphors, I think, aren't, don't have to be true. They can be powerful without, um, um, yes, uh, convincing the reader of the importance of the research topic area. That's claiming centrality, of course, except claiming centrality disappeared from the original models. And so if you look at the 2004 introduction RA model in uh, Swales's uh, research genres, claiming centrality has disappeared. I don't understand that because I look at research articles and I see claiming centrality at the beginning of many, um, many research articles. And, and I suppose there is this uh, move which is, what, what, what's it called, I don't know, um, making statements of increasing uh, specificity, uh, which again, for me, how about contextualizing the research for the reader? Something which, I'm, so I'm offering actually some alternative move names, which might actually mean more to my students. Um, oh, what's happened there? Um, right, cyclic move patterns have been identified in move analyses, so that's nature and formulation. I suppose I'm saying that I think we there's lots of cyclicity going on in lots of texts, basically. Repetition of moves, different move patterns, and we tend to underestimate their, their prevalence and presence. People like, the, so the linear model that you get from the RAs in, from John Swales again, this is how people tend to see genre rather in, cycle, in terms of cyclic and repetitive patterns, which I do think in, uh, are going to be more, they are more prominent in, in lengthy texts. And there's plenty of uh, citations to show that, which I'll get to in a second. So I, a more widespread acceptance of the prevalence or looking, being aware of repetitive cyclic patterns would enhance genre research and pedagogy. Uh, essays are seen as not susceptible to Swayzean genre, genre analysis in the same kind of way as others are, but there's cyclic patterns inside essays. Oh, that's what I'm saying. What's happening there? It's rejected my... Uh, I don't know what's happening there. Sorry. This is the... There's a beautiful diagram there on my original slides, and I don't know why it's not coming up on this, this the system here. Maybe if I go, oh dear me, it's not on there either. And it's beautiful. <laughs> it's true, it's from my paper in 2016 on, uh, it's a good job I didn't do a lovely diagram for the next slide, on options analysis. But it just shows my multiple cycles, 
um, cycle of moves, but one sub move leads to another cycle and another cycle. There are three levels, at least three levels anyway, because people uh, it just goes into options analysis and the different processes. But I'll, you'll have to look at my my paper, which I think is my best paper, by the way. <laughs> he said blushing, but um, it, it's uh, what would I say about that? Yes, and hardly anyone looks at it, but they look at the other one on business case reports. So in essays, you've got you may have orientation. Um, I took some swales in argument. This is a slide I meant to modify, actually. So the, it's his argument in a couple of paragraphs, orientation to proposition, orientation to argument structure. Two moves in one sentence, by the way. We like to see moves as beautifully discrete, but I find a couple of moves in one in, in each sentence. Then maybe two cycles here. So present justification rationale in support of proposition. So the first argument, sub move one and sub move two, sub move three. I could turn this into a cyclic diagram, but it wouldn't have turned up on the. Um, and then we could have justification. This is this is not theoretical. I analysed parts of Swales' writing himself to produce this. Then j second cycle, justification rationale two, sub move one, and sub move two. So there are some patterns in essays. Impact of ESP genre theater theory on EAP teaching. I don't think we've got much measure of the impact of genre theory. And uh, in particular, rhetorical move analysis in teaching in EAP. For example, essays are a key genre family. 43% of assignments in the Bohr corpus um, are, are essays. Um, but they may still be being taught using big things like introduction, body, conclusion, um, with actually little reference made to Nessie and Gardner's research and the research of others, and little focus on rhetorical moves. So, you know, I love Nessie and Gardner's research, it's wonderful. on, on and the like, and you know, insightful, and the, and so forth. But when we do well, essay, when you teach essay writing, are you very much focused on genre? Well, uh, Nessie and Gardner identify six different types of essays. Again, that adds complexity to the classroom, doesn't it? In terms of what we're doing. So, what are we doing there? Um, easier to do this with research articles and PhD writing. Again, but there's little systematic evidence. So we might teach about stance, paragraph structure, use of conduction, conjunctions, argument structure, citation format, topics, sentences, all that kind of stuff. To what extent are we tying these to genre analysis? A number of basic course books don't have much about genre in them. Maybe that's because at lower levels people don't want to focus on it, but language always exists in context. I'm going to dash through a few slides here. But I think we need a more systematic overview of the influence of swales in genre uh, research on in EAP. Some people may not be using it at all at some institutions. Should they be? Um, obviously there's research on the effectiveness of genre teaching, tourist information bro brochures, film reviews, email messages, literature reviews, research articles. But even with Anne Cheng's paper on research articles, it's a case study with focus on one student out of 22 stu two students in the class. So how did the other 21 do? There's a little mark note in the conclusion section which says the other students seem to make improvements too. But I don't think that's very <laughs> substantive. <laughs> you know, and I think there was another paper a few years ago where John Swell did report that a lot of students didn't, ended up not attending most of the course on genre. Um, so I think there's no substantive effectiveness. Um, so we need to conduct further research on the impact of Swell's in genre theory we research the effects of our genre of teaching and learning on students in situ. So what are they doing on their courses? So we teach, maybe we mentioned genre on courses, so business students go off and write a case study. Is it having any effect on what they do? What's happening in their minds when they're doing this? Um, do they think in genre terms, demonstrate and apply genre, genre awareness? In fact, occluded genres. They don't see many of the texts that they come across and they have to produce them and so, well, yes. So we've got our analysis, how much are we helping them? Further evaluated data. You can tell me we've got, uh, yes, is it of value to apply as well as in genre approach? So I've mentioned some nomenclature issues, because it's about 20 minutes now, issues of definition. I may seem a bit rushed, apologies for that. The nature and formulation of rhetorical moves and issues tied to cyclicity and, and genre, the actual impact of swales in genre theory, and the need for further research in a few different areas. Swales in 2019, I suppose he reflected, and he said genre research is too textual. I, I, 
I'm not sure. You know, again, I don't necessarily agree with these points. I think, I don't know, text analysis is fun anyway, trying to interpret what's going on. Too thin in context, so uh, I don't know how much thick descriptions, which is this Geert's term, how much descriptions of context and that actually influence students' performance. I suppose I'm very much focused on you know, getting students to write better in the genres that they have to write. Um, genre research is too concerned with overall structure. Well, I've demonstrated my concern for structure. It's too interested in the inter interpersonal promotional aspects of research writing. I think this was a bit of a dig at Ken Highland, who I noticed was here at this conference. Obviously, he does a lot about interpersonal uh, stuff in writing, okay? Um, over the focus on our own fields of linguistics and ESL. Obviously, that's convenient sampling. If it is, you know, it's easiest for us to get hold of info in those areas. There's a lot of references. So I've been told to stop, and we have 20 minutes for discussion. <laughs>